Harvard University and the University of Minnesota, wow. and, and then two uh, 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 conservation uh, organizations, so uh, the Wildlife Fund and the Nature Conservancy. And it's actually a nice partnership because, you know, academics have strengths and weaknesses. We, we can gin up new stuff and, you know, if we need somebody to you know, write down a crazy equation, I'm always up for that. But, you know, if we need something on the ground, we need people who actually practice and work with people and have the staying power to get things uh, accomplished on the ground, you know, academics are not well suited for that. So it's a nice uh, marriage between you know, the academics and uh, practitioners. And one of the products uh, that we've been working on as part of this partnership is, is a set of computer software called INVEST, or Integrated Valuation of Ecosystem Services and Trade-offs. Um, I think it's Heather Tallis who gets credit for coming up with the acronym. Um, but I'll, I'll give you some examples about how to, uh, you know, how this applies to the kinds of problems that I was laying out um, at the beginning. Before I do though, so what this is, invest, is a set of computer-based models or modules to track multiple ecosystem services and biodiversity, which don't label as a service, it's its, its own thing. Um, it's driven by future scenarios, so what happens on the land? Is land use changing? Is population changing? What's happening with climate and so forth? And then it's spatially explicit because where things happen on the ground matter. And you can report things either in biophysical terms or in uh, economic terms. Okay? And some things are easier to report in economic terms. The translation is easier if it's going like I'm producing agricultural crops which are going through markets. And other things are very difficult, like, you know, so people, a couple of people asked me this week, well, how do you value biodiversity? Well, I don't value biodiversity. I'm going to leave that as a, as a, you know, if it's species diversity or something, I'll leave that as, it's, uh, as a unit, as we'll talk about in a moment. And then the idea here is that it's freely available, it's flexible and transferable. So, you know, you go to a new area, we don't want to have to reinvent the wheel each time. We'd like to have uh, things that can be easily used but brought to data in a particular place or tailored to a particular place. Okay, and um, the, the process is it's not just, so unfortunately, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the, the, the back room nerd part of this, thinking about how do you do the models and, you know, but, but there's a larger process of which this fits into. So thinking about um, the stakeholder engagement. So what are the important problems? What are the services or the things that people are caring about, what are the options, what are the choices that they, they face. That doesn't come from the science, that comes from what is it, you know, the choices that people face and what is it that they're, they're caring about. But then thinking about the scenarios, what are the choices, what are the outcomes, what are the driving factors in the area, and then once you have that, feed this into a set of biophysical and economic models to talk about how is this affecting the things that you said you care about, come back to the stakeholder group and iterate. Okay, so is this what you want, right? Is this the outcome that, that you wanted? So try to foresee or predict outcomes before they happen. So you don't have to make an actual mistake and try to avoid some of them uh, before you do. Okay, well let me stop talking in general terms and, and give you a couple of examples. And um, so I'm gonna run through a set of four examples, hopefully fairly quickly, just to give you a flavor of this kind of integrated uh, analysis. So the first one is a, is a paper actually predates Invest, um, but it, it highlights um, a particular thing about trade-offs. In this case, they don't have to value everything in dollars. I'm going to talk about uh, a biological objective, which is uh, conserving a set of terrestrial vertebrate species, and an economic objective. How well are, how much income are we generating for people who live in the area, either from agriculture, from timber, or from housing development? Okay, so what we want to do here is I'm going to focus on land use choices. Uh, so I'll talk about a land use pattern which specifies sort of what activities happen in various places across the landscape. I'm going to be concerned about, um, here it says biodiversity, really it's, it's species and it's terrestrial vertebrate species. So how well are a set of terrestrial vertebrate species going to be able to maintain viable populations on the landscape given the land use pattern. And so the biological model, in fact, does just that. We, we focused on 267 terrestrial uh, species. Actually, that's 
If you have 267, I, I think the word focus is probably not the right one. We included 267 threatened bird species. And if you want to ask me how we did this, I'll give you just sort of a hint, which is we focused on different groupings. So, all, you know, large mammals, small mammals, they have different ability to disperse. They have different habitat needs and so forth. Um, and in fact, uh, the biological model runs off of a, sort of a habitat map, uh, which is determined in part by land use and determined in part by if you leave something alone, what's the uh, biological, you know, what, what kind of habitat is it, is it going to be, so biophysically determined. And an economic model, so both the biological model and the economic model are running off of a common set of inputs, which are land use and things like climate and soil and, and so forth. The economic model looks at the value of agriculture and of timber um, and of rural residential housing. It's a function of where you put things on, on the landscape. And so the question that we're uh, really been thinking about in this is, well, look, we care about both things. So what kinds of landscapes are going to do well on both? And this from economics, a term called the efficiency frontier, says, well, if I do as well as I possibly can, uh, you know, so I give myself a constraint, like I have to preserve a certain number of species, then how, how much, you know, what's the best I can do in economics, or change, change it around. I give myself a constraint, I have to, you know, I can only have so many, so large of a budget or so much cost, how would I then maximize how well the species are doing? So this was done in the Willamette Basin in Oregon. For those of you who don't know, Oregon is part of the, it's on the west coast, Pacific coast. Um, northwest part of the United States, and the Willamette Basin is in the northwest part of Oregon. So it's very uh, green, very wet, uh, gets lots of rainfall, especially in the winter. It's composed of uh, a valley between two uh, mountain ranges, a coast range, which is just a sliver uh, over here, the valley floor, which is where the cities are, agriculture, and then another more substantial uh, range of, of mountains, the coast range. Excuse me, the Cascade Mountain. And then here's the current uh, land use. So again, you can see in the valley floor, a lot of agriculture, which is that color. White is urban areas. And then various uh, forests of, of various ages. Okay, so as you move up the Cascades, you tend to get less uh, active forestry and older, uh, older stands. Okay, so what did we do with this? Well, we apply the, the models. We said, and, and, and here, you get to, this is really fun if you've never done this. It's like you get to play God on the landscape. Well, where do things belong on this landscape? And so what we did was we, I mean, here's the current landscape, but then we said, well, what if we could put things where we want them? And we searched over lots and lots of different landscapes, like this point A, which is this map here. This is if you wanted to, you didn't care about biodiversity, you just maximized uh, economic returns. Or up here, you care about how well were the species doing, but I don't care about the economic returns. And then everything in between. So you trace out what we call this, this frontier, or efficiency frontier. Now there's a couple of things that I wanted to make note of in this. First of all, when I was doing this analysis, I was living in Oregon, in the Willamette Basin. And at the time, in the US, we had a, a, a horrendous fight over the spotted owl, an endangered species policy. And um, it was cast as, this is jobs versus owls. You know, it's, it's the economy or the environment, and it's, you can't have both. You've got to pick one side or the other. <coughs> well, we were at point I at the time, right? It's like, you know what? I can have more owls and more jobs by thinking carefully about how we're going to put things together, right? So you could actually do better on both. Now, when, when you're at a point like out here, like let's say a D or an E or something like that, Yes, it's a trade-off, but we're nowhere close to that point. You know, so people talk about win-win. Well, here's a clear case where we just didn't organize ourselves. We weren't thinking clearly about our objectives and how our actions translate um, to objectives. Now, I want to make one further point. So you can dissect and go down a little bit in this, and um, so uh, you know, you can think about. So what I've done here, it's too small to read, I'm sure. But these are the, the species which gain the most, like if you went from the map in A to the map in B. Right? So this is the, these are the ones that, and basically what you can do here is you can do really well in terms of increasing how well the species are doing at almost no cost. Right? This is almost a vertical line. 
And these species depend upon very rare habitat types in the Willamette Basin. So you restore very rare habitat types, you don't need much land, it's not very expensive land. You know, we should, we should be doing these kinds of things. The, the one other one thing I want to point out here is, again, this is, I'm sure, too small to read, but that's, that's the spotted owl right there. It doesn't do well until you have lots of old growth forest, which means you're keeping the loggers out of lots of blocks of, of contiguous forest, and that unfortunately is causing it. So, you know, there are conflicts, and certain things, I mean, there is a reason why the spotted owl, in this case, actually was a, was a conflict. Okay, now the other thing I, I want to point out is, I haven't done anything particularly value-oriented here. I have